and that uh, you know what I put I loaded the wrong slides I'm very embarrassed about this because this is obviously a draft set of slides and I don't know if there's any hope of changing at this point um, I think I'll just forge ahead and I will post the final slides on the website and please accept my apologies because we're going to see some more of these mistakes as we go along. Um, maintenance of effort is um, for public libraries their in-kind contributions uh, have to be maintained over the years and so that state funding does not supplant local funding for public libraries and this regulation has been in effect since state aid of local funds. Interestingly, their effort um, for library funding in North Carolina in order to continue to be eligible for LSTA funding at the maximum level that we're um, allowed. So it, it's a well-known concept in library funding. Uh, so it became clear this year that some public libraries were not aware that some of their contributions that could be termed in-kind contributions, that those could be counted toward maintenance, maintenance of effort. And that is because these contributions are not running through the library's budget. So it could be that the, a county is paying utilities on behalf of a public library and that amount is reflected only in the county budget. The minute we became aware that some libraries weren't uh, weren't aware of this, we conducted a poll and said, um, 
A, did you know that this you can use these count these funds toward maintenance of effort? And B, if you did count these toward maintenance of effort, would it make a diff would it make a difference um, to your being able to meet maintenance of effort? Uh, this year, when we calculated state aid, 25 public libraries were not going to meet their maintenance of effort. State that would then be recalculated and redistributed to the other libraries that qualify for state aid. Ten libraries actually were able to recalculate their state aid using these in-kind contributions and were able to qualify for more state funds. So um, this made an, a, a, a big difference to those libraries. Unfortunately, the downside to that is it really slowed down our um, time frame for calculating final state aid payments and that was a little painful for some of the libraries and we definitely know that we have definitely heard that message and we're going to um, try to speed that up next year we will not be making the same mistake we may make a different mistake next year but it won't be this one should you have any questions about any of this maintenance of effort our state aid calculations you can contact Jennifer Pratt here at the State Library. She's the Chief of the Library Development Section and she'll be happy to talk to you or answer any questions that you may have. I'm moving on to the next slide. I'm a little concerned what we're going to see. Oh, this one actually looks okay. We're talking now about our library had to um, craft a new five-year plan for these funds. This is a requirement that IMLS places on the state library agencies. We did that and we actually um, submitted it and it has been approved. Um, at the same time, we also sub uh, submitted a waiver letter asking for a waiver because the state of North Carolina is not currently meeting its maintenance of effort requirement for these federal funds. This is the second year in a row that, um, that the state economy has, um, has been lower than it has been in the past and we haven't been able to maintain our effort. We've gotten uh, a pass for both of those years, last year and this year. Um, I was shocked to hear that uh, North Carolina was one of only eight libraries requesting a waiver this year. And um, the director of uh, IMLS says that it's going to get harder and harder to grant those waivers because the wording, it has to be an unprecedented and unforeseen drop in state funds. Well, three years later, you know, we can kind of foresee it. So I don't know what's going to happen next year, but we'll continue to try to qualify for the maximum amount of funds for which we're eligible. Um, we, with the new five-year plan, <clears throat> we've been very, um, uh, aggressive about getting the word out about that plan and um, helping people who might want to apply for grants sponsored webinars and face-to-face -face workshops about the new five-year plan and about the new grant categories um, for this coming year. Those are archived and you can see the um, URL right there. And um, I encourage you, if you would like to, uh, you know, apply for an easy grant to go look at the, the archived materials if you have any questions about the grant categories. Um, the project grants, which are the larger grants, um, require a letter of intent and that is to save you trouble and time for applying for a grant that perhaps is not eligible 
under the category or doesn't somehow meet qualifications. We received 18 letters of intent this year and staff have already reviewed those and gotten back to libraries um, about their um, proposed projects. The great thing about those letters of intent is that it allows us to say, you know, your application will be a lot stronger if you can address this or if you can include this or that. So um, these are the high dollar grants and um, that's why they require a letter of intent. Uh, I was happy to see that some of the grants did have some outside the box ideas and I'm excited about those. We're encouraging libraries to think creatively this year under the new five-year plan. If you plan to uh, submit an easy grant in any of the categories, those will be due, well actually all applications will be due February 28th. So it's consultant. Or answer any questions you may have about that. Moving on to personnel, we've got quite a few things happening among staff. We have a new doing our, well, all of our um, statistics gathering. And in fact, she's off this week at a workshop learning how to do that. 
David Green is not the database specialist. He's the data specialist for NC Cardinal, working with Tanya Procrim, and I know she's very happy to have him on site to help out. Uh, in the Library for the Blind, we have a new Reader's Advisor, and in the Government and Heritage Library, we have a new Documents Assistant. Uh, Laura O'Donohue, the
Public Library of America and will be starting that job very shortly. She's only got a few more days here. Uh, there's Laura's old position. We're recruiting for that. We're looking for a circulation assistant and a library technician. I happened to be talking to Maggie Height at Chapel Hill the other day about something totally unrelated, and she asked me to help get the word out about their open director's position. They have reopened the search for the director of the Chapel Hill Public Library, and I said, well, sure, I'll help you, Maggie. So there you go. If you're interested in that job, um, check it out on, well, there's a job line where there's uh, listings of jobs on the State Library website. You can check there. I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about the Government and Heritage Library now. Um, NCpedia is the North Carolina Online Encyclopedia. They have uh, they hit 2 million page views in November, and you can see there is the URL for that resource right there. Um, this is uh, more page views than they had in all of 2011. So we're feeling comfortable that the added content in NCpedia is making it a more valuable resource. I know also that more libraries are adding the little widget, the search widget box or the search box for NCpedia on their home pages, and that is also uh, bringing it to patrons' attention. Uh, so we're getting more um, usage of that very valuable resource, especially, it's especially beloved of about to finish being enriched all the time with the addition of new articles and um, <clears throat> data and information. The Government and Heritage Library is actually the library portion of the State Library, and I don't know if you have ever been to, to see it, but if you have, you know they have an interesting and varied collection down there. They are charged with serving state government. We have a demographics expert. There's a portion that deals with genealogy. So we're doing a little, um, we have a consultant on site right now. They're working with us to look at how the GHL is working. Um, there's doing things right, and then there's doing the right things. And this, this consultant is looking to see what, what it is that they're doing and uh, are they doing the right things. And we're also interested in if they're doing them right. If you have any questions or comments about the Government and Heritage Library, uh, your, your contact down there would be Jan Reagan. She's the section chief for the Library Services section. A little bit more info about GHL. Oh, these slides are driving me crazy. I am really sorry, you all. This is just, I don't know why I didn't. OK. All right, we're just going to go back to the GHL. Jeffrey, maybe you can tell me if I could reload slides, because I'm, I'm highly embarrassed. But I will go ahead and talk about the News and Observer Index. This is really a cool resource, and I'm sorry that um, I can't show you that slide. But um, for since 1926, library staff have been keeping an index card file for the Raleigh News and Observer newspaper. And these have been typical, you know, card files in drawers, and that's great if you're here in Raleigh, but if you're not here in Raleigh, what can you do? Well, now you can check the online index to the News and Observer, and the dates for that index are 1926 to 1992. And we're, this is a project that, okay, I'm going to upload the right PowerPoint. I'm just going to, hold on, y'all. I really apologize. I need to figure out how, I think Jeffrey's coming now.
<laughs> Stop sharing. Okay, guys, be right back. And this new index be added to NC Live. I have no idea. I'm going to try this. There's no way to see. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna... Thanks, y'all. This looks better. There we go. Okay. I think we're all right. Thank you, Jeffrey. She has a question. I have learned a valuable lesson. Okay. NCpedia is coming up with an error message at this time. Thank you. Sorry about that, Christy. You don't know what. Uh... Uh, will this new index be added to NC Live? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but we're going to um, follow up on that, Sue. Thank you. I, I don't know. It says... Um, the index created by librarians on index cards is publicly available as a searchable web-based database 
that contains 300 plus record, 300,000 records or subject headings pointing to 500,000 article references. So I will, we're, we're taping this and we will um, check and see if that's going to be on NC Live or not. Probably so though. Um, I wanted to point out the the new, uh, some of the free workshops that are coming up from the Government and Heritage Library genealogy section. These will all be held in Raleigh. Um, we've had one request from a public library that wants to dovetail with the, one of the workshops, so we're excited about that and, and working and sharing what we've got with the libraries around the state. Particularly fun, I think, is the October 26th Family History Fair, and these are all going to be in 2013, and um, uh, we had almost 100 people come to that last year, and it's there's some really neat stuff going on at that Family History Fair, so if you have um, genealogists, you might want to let them know. It's a little early, but you can let them know. These are all in Raleigh, yeah, but there's you know, maybe we could take some on the road. If you're interested in working with us, let us know. Uh, you can contact me about that, and I will pass that on to the correct person. Um, another, there's three parts of the State Library, and the Government and Heritage Library is one, type, one part. Another part is the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. Okay, Lynn, Catawba County is interested. I will make a note. Um, Anyway, the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped um, serves <clears throat> any North Carolina resident that has difficulty seeing a printed material or even holding printed material. Uh, it's a really nice service uh, and they have a lot of very loyal users. In, and they have a lot of volunteers. So we just recently in November held their volunteer dinner. It was the first one I ever got to go to. It was a lot of fun. They have a lot of volunteers, and those volunteers put in a lot of hours. They also have a very active friends group. If you know of any patrons who could receive service from the Library for the Blind, I encourage you to um, get them contacted, get them signed up for the service. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of centenarian patrons, including uh, one, the oldest patron is 110 years old, and um, that patron, Lois Tracy, is an active reader of audiobooks on both cassette tapes and the new format of digital cartridges. I just love that. I think that's cool, and that is means there's hope for all of us. They are always recruiting new patrons, so if you know it could be any age, they serve children. They have a large print collection, so if you know of anyone who could benefit from those services, I encourage you to point them in the direction of the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. Moving on now to library development, this is what a lot of people, a lot of public librarians think of when they think of the state library. Um, Laurie Special, the Youth Services Consultant, is in the process of planning summer reading workshops right now. There will be one in Silva on April 2nd, in Durham on March 3rd, and in Henderson on March 26th. She's still looking for a host site along the South or Central I-85 corridor. If you would like to volunteer, give Laurie a call. She would love to hear from you. This is a, the day-long summer reading workshop.